please help me welcome to the stage Andrew Lincoln! Denai Gurira! Chandler Riggs! Steve Yan! Lauren Cohen! Ross Marquand! Sonequa Martin Green! Michael Cutlets! Christian Serratos! Josh McDermott! Norman Reedus! And last but not least, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Are we pissing our pants yet? You motherfuckers. <laughs> you can breathe. You can blink. You can fucking cry. <laughs> I would. Oh, hell, you're all going to be doing that. <laughs> or you can lead us on a little moderation. All right. <laughs> I, listen. If it was me who got it in the end, I think people would be fine with that. Uh, this has been an amazing... Uh, I, I will say one thing about that's happened over the summer that I've not seen happen after previous seasons, which is this, in, this incredible sense of community around that. Even in the last panel, some guy said, who did Negan kill? I was in a remote part of California, and this, old, this guy, a barber outside his shop, this old guy, was walking across the street. Never would have thought to say hi to the guy, and he shouted across the street, I think it's Glenn, or whatever. And it's just like, this is, the, we're all, everyone's speculating, and people are asking, what, what's it been like for you to be a, become a part of this fandom and to become a part of this community? I think I've been kind of living in this bubble in Georgia. I mean, I've only been on the show for about 12 minutes thus far, um, and, and then kind of went to work, but I've never been, I was in New York when the first episode that you'll see me aired in 16, I guess, so last year. Uh, and I've never been stopped so much in my life, ever. Um, and I'm getting a little bit of a feel for it, though we haven't started airing yet. I, I hang out with the cast. As the, the cast that shall not be named. Yeah, just the cast. <laughs> and people, wherever you are, and we're kind of in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, but you can go somewhere and people like come out of the floor and ceilings and walls that you didn't know were there. You think you're kind of alone and, and converge upon the cast. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And the fans have been nothing but awesome, a as well as everyone you see sitting up here. Well, this, I mean, I really, you know, to see what's happened with Walking Dead and having been there almost from the beginning, it's been an incredible thing to watch and one of the most significant exper experiences to be even close to. But you are now forever, you are part of this community and yeah. you are part of this world. It's cool because I've been a fan of the show since it started, a as well as the comic book. So then to step in, in this role in particular and with these people has been nothing short of awesome. Scott, can you talk a little about the new locations and some of the new characters and some of the stuff that we're going to see in season seven? Well, there's Karen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you guys know a lot about them. Uh, you saw King Ezekiel there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there he is. There he is. That is Carrie Payton, who is a remarkable actor. And, uh, I, you know, he's a bit younger than Ezekiel is in the book. He's a bit more svelte but he came in and he owned it, and the most important thing is when I showed his audition to Robert, Robert went bananas. Um, he's fantastic, I think people are gonna love him. Excellent, let's start talking to the cast. I'll start with uh, Mr. Andrew Lincoln. <laughs> this entire, this entire, the last half of the season, every episode, as an audience member, I'm going, oh man, don't go in and kill all this, oh, you know, it's just like there was so much hubris and so much like, oh, we, we rule everything. We can take care of everything. So can you describe a little bit what 
it was like shooting the final scene of last last season. Well, it sucked, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, the funny thing was my my mom, who's become a really kind of weirdly super fan. She's always on the internet checking out the show, and she just I had dinner before I I I, I came out, and she said, you know, you've got to get back to that space you were at at the end of last year. <laughs> and I said, um, well, what, what do you mean? She said, well, you've got to dig deep. <laughs> you were seriously committed. And your face, man, you were terrified. You were weeping. You were like a child. You were, it was, and I said, are you giving me acting notes? <laughs> and even my wife just went, really, p come on, Laura, pipe down, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it was a pretty intense return, you know, after having a, a, a hiatus and sort of chilling in my orchard to come back and see his face. Can I just point out that he's having way too much fun <laughs> playing this dude. Um, but look, I'm not going to talk about it. I, 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 we made a, I spoke about this before, and, and I'll say it again, is that we all link arms. It's, it's a really shitty start to the season, but hang in there, guys. I know you will, because we're, we're heading towards, I think, one of the greatest showdowns that we've had in this show since Terminus. So hang in there with us. I know you will. Uh, Steve Young, uh, who I know read the comics before, you had been a fan of the comics before the show, and we, we talked a lot about <laughs> when issue 100 came out, and we talked about this point in the story, and now here we are at this point in the story. So how, how has this felt for you, and what did it, what did it feel like reaching this part? Um, I've always been a huge fan of the comics, and um, I remember that particular issue. Uh, my cousin called me, and he was like, yo, Glenn's got it too good right now. Uh, 100's coming out. I don't know what's going to happen. And obviously, after 100 came out, I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was an oh, crap, but it was also this amazing, like, this is incredible. To be 100 issues in and to land a bomb like this to propel it forward was so incredible. And for me, as a fan, I was like, this moment is iconic and however it happens, it's, it's such a great moment. And when we led up to it, to see you know, all the components that were happening and to see Negan in the flesh uh, is awesome. To, to know that from here on out, uh, that there's gonna be an opening uh, to just thrust the show even further. And for me as a fan and uh, as a participant, like it's, it's probably one of the coolest things ever. Uh, Lauren Cohan, you, uh, Maggie is, <laughs> Maggie's having a severe medical crisis when we left off, and, and on top of the fact that she's kneeling in front of Negan and is probably as conscious as she can be at this point, knows something really terrible is going to happen, so what, what is the preparation like with, with that kind of, that, that layered tragedy? Yeah, um, you know what's funny, the show gives us this opportunity to go to such visceral places and um, this episode, that episode for all of us was one of the most physically and emotionally um, demanding things. I mean, I was actually reflecting on it and just thinking, I love Ross and Sonequa and Michael for carrying me on that stretch up for days and days and um, it's, it was, you know, we, we had a really good time. Um, and Andy, and um, it was when you see that purple exhausted makeup and you, I don't know, for two weeks or so, we were sort of in that state and it was just a really, a really crazy thing. I just, I'm just like sitting up here with everybody just thinking how lucky we are to be, you know, you don't act anything. You get to go to the creative space and obviously I'm, I don't have the, the illness Maggie has in there, but we, we get to be together and like, go to physical crazy and emotionally crazy places and we do that together. I don't know, I'm on a bit of an emotional uh, tangent here, but you get me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, don't, you don't have that illness, though? <laughs> I, d I don't. I, I did think about when I had my appendix taken out, though, and I had two days where my mom was like, you're fine, you need to go to the bathroom, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> and then I got to the hospital and they were like, wow, you were about to die. Good thing you got in here, so they took out my appendix. So I channeled a little bit of that, but I mostly just um, 
you know, that I think that episode, what so many of us have experienced is that guilt, like is, is the choice that that character made responsible for getting us to that, to the end of Negan's bat or to the situation. And Maggie definitely, you know, was so, you know, feeling the need to protect. Chandler, um, this scene for you at the end, I mean, it, he's, Carl's really trying to grow up. He's had to grow up really fast. And now uh, he is sans one eye. And so you're, you're kneeling and you have this patch on your eye. So what, how is that as a performer, like to, to be acting basically with a patch and what was the experience like? I mean, <laughs> death perception is my, <laughs> my biggest loss there. It's, it's so annoying because like, when there's like a bug, I can't tell if it's like right here or like right here. So I'll just be like swatting and like a bug like all the way over there. But um, I thought that was just your natural tick. <laughs> no, no. You're not crazy? No. I don't. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I actually um, enjoyed wearing uh, the prosthetic in episode nine a lot more than I enjoy wearing the bandage just because with the bandage, they always want like they always want to see my eyebrows. So they have to constantly push it up and then like pull it down on this side. And after every take, we have to readjust it versus the prosthetic. It's just like an hour of putting on, and it looks really cool too. So it's it's a lot a lot more chill and easy. But um, yeah, you don't realize how much like vision you lose. Like it, it's like a good seventy degrees of vision that is like completely gone. Like remember Norman tapping on my like constantly tapping on my other shoulder, and I'd be like. <laughs> yeah. See, so. uh, yeah. deny. Um, I'd love to talk about really quickly. Your Michonne has had such an incredible. She was this reclusive warrior when we first saw her. She was very closed off. Then she started to open up. She was kind of reborn, and now we're actually seeing the most human, complex, and romantic side of her. So, can you talk a little bit about the vulnerability between uh, Rick and Michonne? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was interesting because I was, you know, I was thinking about this question, and I was the moment I feel where her vulnerability really started to open up, specifically towards uh, Rick. Actually, I think it was a really long time ago. Uh, it was episode, the episode entitled "Clear," uh, which was also written by Mr. Scott Gimple over there, and um, it really was this moment I think where she not only bonds with his son in a way that is really reviving for her and opens her up and allows her to start putting down all those layers and all, the, all that armor, just begin to go there in terms of you know, investing in a young life and, and seeing his light and, and, and having an empathy, a sympathy for this young man in this world and, and knowing what it is like to be a mother and, and, and wanting to be there for him. And, so, and his acceptance of her by the end of the episode is, really opens up her heart. But everything, I think, connected to Rick and Michonne connects in with Carl too at times because it's kind of like he accepts her first and uh, then there's this, the, the moments between uh, Rick and Michonne in that episode that to me, there's one in particular um, that for me that day that we shot it, I was like, huh, maybe she's gonna see him that way one day. Uh, which was the moment in, uh, it was in the jail cell when we were looking for bullets and ammo and there's none, it was, um, an ill-devised plan, and uh, Michonne does not call him out for this, but he kind of thinks she is, so she hands him the one bullet that she did find, and, and he kind of snaps at her, uh, and her response is, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And it was so funny, when we shot it, it was the crew, it was the crew that were on set, they all uh, looked over to Mr. Gimple, uh, funnily, because he was there, of course, and they were like, are Rick and Michonne gonna get together? And I was like, I was like, huh? <laughs> and, and I don't know, I don't know what it was, but they, 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 at that moment, I thought that makes sense actually, because this, for her, it made sense to me because she is a woman who has to deeply respect the man she opens up to, and that she was already developing such a respect from him, the way she treated him versus the way she treated the governor. She could see he was such a, like, he was a good man burdened with leadership versus he needed leadership to feel like a man. So there was something about that, connect, that realization of seeing him like that and seeing his brokenness and his pain and things that she could connect to that were making her put down her mess and, and open up more. So that sort of journey, it, you know, it, I think it's awesome it took as long as it did because it developed a very complex connection um, and allowed her to 
work through her several wounds and, and, and armory. Well, obviously, uh, Rick's other significant romantic relationship is Daryl. Uh, <laughs> And Norman, uh, I believe you brought a video to illustrate this. Oh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of what's about to happen. I, I'm, like, I'm on pins and needles. Um, yeah, but, uh, this is what happened. Uh, for, it started off, we went to Tokyo, and uh, we were super tired, and we were jet lagged, and we were sitting there, and, and early in the morning, and Andy goes, you speak a little Japanese, don't you? And I go, yeah. And he goes, how do you say... Thank you for having me in your country. I didn't do the hand movements. Yeah, you kind of did. <laughs> and so I said, Toile wa doko deska. And he goes, how? And I go, Toile wa doko deska. Then he goes, wait, wait, before we start, Toile wa doko deska. And um, I didn't do the they're hand. looking at him like, what? And then he goes, Toile wa doko deska. And he goes, what did I just say? And I said, where's the toilet? <laughs> so, but there's, a, there's an ongoing prank thing, which I, th I think something's about to fall out of the sky. <laughs> but, um, and then I put chickens in his trailer one day. And then I came back from having my windows tinted on my truck, and it, saying, it said Andy's B-I-T-C-H across the front of it. Which <laughs> was that was a really good one. Thank you very much. And then we had... Thank you, uh, Transpo. For that help. Yeah. And then we had then then I'm on set and I get a package and I open it and glitter explodes in my face. Uh -uh. That was him. Yeah. And then this is what <laughs> happened next. The worst thing about that is that it landed on you. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a mean prank. That stuff that is like glitter is like clown herpes. Like it does not no, it doesn't come out. It never goes <laughs> away. You're absolutely right. I in a year, it'd be like, it's still I, in my ear. I, I, I drove home from that point, and there were people at red lights looking at me like I was, you know, like I'd been clubbing or <laughs> to a club, you know what I'm saying? And then I went, I, it's, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to, before I go home and get humiliated, I kind of went to and vacuumed the thing up, you know, and it took me 25 minutes. And I was beating up with sweat and all the rest of it. I got back in the car. And I cranked up the aircon again, and it just went whoosh, <laughs> stuck to my sweaty face. And then I went to the coffee shop, and they said, w w you've got something in your hairline. <laughs> now they're calling me Sparkles, <laughs> Glitter Boy. I used to be somebody in my own hometown. <laughs> and, and, and when I got on the plane to go to San Diego, my two children had tears in their eyes. And they said, what did Nanny Norman do? <laughs> and I said, sweethearts, he's, he's humiliated your father <laughs> on an international scale. And they said, what can we do? And I said, so believe me, we, it, this isn't the end. <laughs> oh, man. I, oh, dear. It's in your beard. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Could not have backfired oh, more. Oh man! <laughs> oh dear. It's not as more. Yeah. Oh my. Here you. Oh. You look like a crazy <laughs> prospector. That, that didn't go quite the way I wanted it. <laughs> Deny was an innocent bystander. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, the Game what? of Thrones people are going to look fabulous. <laughs> I think we're looking Andy, forward to the. Oh, <laughs> dude! <laughs> don't eat it, Andy. Backfire. That was. <laughs> that was the most amazing. <laughs> I let you down, my children. <laughs> Follow, followed, followed by Daddy. The I good think news you've is, this is just again. between us. <laughs> it looks like uh, Andy. It looks like you've been doing filthy things at the circus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for the glitter tatership of season seven. <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> You're never gonna get that out. No, no. that's you have now. To shave that thing. <laughs> that is you now. Next question, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I want to. Ah, crap. Uh, <clears throat> I want to welcome Josh McDermott. This is his first San Diego Comic Con. Whoa. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. This is fun. Have you, seen, have you seen the Eugene cosplayers? Have you seen some Eugene cosplayers? I've seen a lot of Eugene cosplays. I feel like, uh, you know, guys dress up as Eugene, that's to be expected. I get it. Maybe you don't have the body to be Daryl. 
<laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But uh, I'm starting to see a lot of uh, female Eugenes. Awesome. Because I think they have the long hair, so they can kind of put it into a mullet easily and, and that sort of thing. But I look at them, and it's like, I kind of want to sleep with Eugene. <laughs> like, I don't know, you know. It's, I've never really pictured Eugene as a sex symbol, so if... Uh, if I don't get killed off, Scott Gimple, I would love to uh, explore that storyline. <laughs> it's fun. You know, the thing is, like, they, the attention has to go to the details, right? They have to... Um, I've, I'm seeing cosplay for Eugene where they've set up a bookshelf, like from episode five of season five, where Eugene was spying on Rosita and Abraham having sexy time. Yeah. Hey. And they'll walk around with, like, a makeshift bookshelf that they're just creeping at. <laughs> It's like, that's, that's genius. I love you. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Michael Cudlitz. Uh, it, that's sort of weird. They sat you in between your ex-girlfriend and your current girlfriend. That's a very strange dynamic. It's kind of awesome. He planned it this way. And the man you want to be with. <laughs> what? <laughs> What was that like? What what was that experience for him? What was this epiphany that he had in the last you know last season? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's win win. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> no, I think that um, look early on. I think that uh, both both Abraham and Rosita found each other, and it became a, a relationship of convenience. If you if you follow the the graphic novel, Rosita used her looks to get, to kind of to survive early on. My way. And then her way. The way. The only way. And anyway. after she met Abraham, Abraham was the only person that she had met that didn't want anything from her physically, that actually did connect with her as a human. And he taught her how to be a soldier, which she excelled at. So I think that for the two of them, it just made sense at the time. Now that I think Abraham sees a tomorrow and a tomorrow after tomorrow, he can't deny what his heart is feeling. So it's not convenience anymore, it's, it's actual practicality and he finds a lot of things that he just admires in Sasha to be those things that he has always held important in his life that she already possesses. Uh, will to survive, strength, intelligence, beauty. And he wants to share that with her. And, he, and as hard as it is, because I think he still loves Rosita, would do anything for Rosita and for Eugene, because they are, they are his family. Um, there comes a point where you can't deny what you're feeling. And this is a, a time in the story where he's allowed to feel. And he's reminded that there are things that are worth not only dying for, but living for. And Aww. finds that in her. Oh. That. that was masterful. So, I don't know how you pulled that off, because I think there are a lot of women in the audience like, you son of a bitch, and now everyone's <laughs> crying. <laughs> Sonequa, what was it like working so closely with Cudlets this past season? Uh, it, was, it was so much fun. Um, he and I have a lot of fun um, together, <laughs> a lot of jokes, a lot of, it was a lot of good times, and <laughs> we broke down a few barriers, too, because we, we spent a lot of time in that car, and, um, you know, it got all the way, it got real, you know, he had to help me with my breast milk a couple times. <laughs> I'm, you know, I was still nursing, so I'm pumping every couple of hours, but we cooped up in this car, and and he's like, no, no, give it, give, give it to me. I got it. I got it. I'll take it to the cash chair. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I got it. I got it. I, I know what this is about. I got it. I got it. Is that the, co is, <laughs> you know? is, that, is that the coffee? Is that the? Oh, oh geez. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, it was it was such a it was such a great connection. You know, so he's such a gentleman, and he was so it was very brotherly and sisterly. He was you know taking taking great care, and um, I I I'd, I'd go well. Yeah, he is a dad, and. All right, yeah, take it, take it. Yeah, thank you. In the cooler. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> so that was cool. Um, but yeah, a lot of good conversation. A lot of good times. We, I learned a lot, too, because, you know, obviously, this man, he's been at it for a long time. A lot to learn from him. So it was great. This is also Christian Serratos' first time at uh, San Diego Comic-Con.
I'm what? so nervous. This is so intimidating. There's so many of you. <laughs> no, it's Michael, like... Michael, help her with her breast milk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not intimidating because these people waited. Like, they're here to see you. Like, they want to. No, it's, not, yeah. it's not like they're folding oh, okay. their arms like, you better win us over. Like, they're No, they're but happy. you want to be charming and you want to be funny. And I happen to think I'm very funny. So I'm, I'm nervous. I, like, you have to give me pity laughs if I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> What, uh, what's been rewarding? <laughs> <laughs> touch me. Christian, Christian, Christian. Let's make Josh yeah. really jealous right now. What's been rewarding for you for Rosita's arc? So much. Um, first of all, just getting to work with all these people coming in, you know, after the show has been established and, and, and coming in when I did was a little nerve wracking. You want to make sure that you do a good job and, and you hear so many great things about the show and you just want to like perform and, and you want to bond. And, and I had heard so many great things about the cast and their work ethic and, and I was just really excited that they all took me in and I was able to learn so much from everybody. I mean, even just in the last episode of season six, I feel like you know, we're all such good friends and we all trust each other so much, but to be able to go through that last episode with everyone was such an incredible bonding experience. I really feel like I, I grew as an actor that's gonna be a pivotal moment for me for a long, long time. And that doesn't happen when you can't trust the people you're with, it just cannot. So, so it was really exciting for me to be here for however long I'm here and just know that I've had this moment and even things like Josh was talking about like cosplay. That is so exciting for me. I mean, I'm just like everybody else. I get excited about TV shows and, and cool, fun, interesting things. So to see people dress up as a character I'm portraying is such like a nerdy, exciting thing for me. I love it so much. Even when it's a guy? Even when it's a guy. Even when Michael does it, I get so excited about it. <laughs> the clothes are a little tight. But there's, there's, there's a few like Latina comic book characters that are written, but not many that have been you know, put on a big screen or small screen. So it's just really exciting for me that I see so many Latinas come up to me and say how excited they are to have a really strong woman that they could dress up as. So that makes me really proud. And I hope that I, you know, get to keep portraying this really strong woman for, for as long as I can. Uh, thank you. That was very well done, Christian Serrano. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the, R R Ross Marquand, if you don't know, is an amazing impressionist. And we've tried to... Can, can you just quickly, just, I, I know you, could you just do Harrison Ford for like a quick second? <laughs> just. You know what, Chris? I'm tired of your, your horse crap. You're always getting me up here doing the Harrison Ford and all this. I'm over it, all right? <laughs> Get off of my panel. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> Does that happen on the set a lot? Are you able to do that on the set a lot? What, say it again? Are you able to do that on the set a lot, or is it really serious and tense? It's, it's, it, there's sometimes where it just doesn't make sense to be jokey obviously but uh i remember last season in 612 we were doing the, the raid on the compound and cudlitz and seth gilliam a lot of people don't know this but cudlitz does an amazing sylvester stallone and seth gilliam does an amazing robert de niro and i was playing mick i was B Murgis meredith from rocky and i was like come on you you gotta get in there you gotta give these saviors hell why you gotta get in there he's like come on <laughs> You know they're trying to take half of our stuff. You're not going to let them do that, are you? Why don't we just give them half the stuff and we can walk away? <laughs> well, you got rocks in your head? Come on! I don't know, Mick. You get a little excited and worked up. <laughs> they're going to kill us! Well, I don't think they're going to kill all of us. It might kill maybe... Well, they're going to kill some of us and it could be you! Maybe it's going to be you, Mick. Come on! Get in there and give the old college try! You know, Mick, if you don't shut up, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> 